Thank you, Mike. What a blessing to be here on Easter Sunday. Amen. And uh, good to see so many folk here. We're going to continue to just receive our offering. And while that's going around, can I just say a couple of, um, couple of comments? Do you know that today is the day that the whole world celebrates the resurrection of Christ? And apparently there was a Gallup poll made that uh, 76% of Australians believe that there is a resurrection, that, 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 there is a, uh, that Christ was raised from the dead, and they, they believe that uh, this, this is a historical fact. That's interesting because, you know, they, oh, but I wonder if they know what that really means. I mean, to believe is one thing, and I've often said that the two most powerful words you can say is, I believe. And, uh, and so from that, believing in the resurrection is one thing, but to know the power of the resurrection is another story altogether. And so let's just pray right now and pray for all those who have given and pray that God will use that to increase his kingdom. Father, we thank you that we can be together on this day to lift up that name that is above every name. We pray, my God, that every person who gave generously, every person who gave out of their heart, Lord, you will pour out your spirit upon them, bless them. Lord, we can never outgive you, but Lord, we thank you for the opportunity of sharing with what you're doing in this area of Brisbane in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 3. And uh, this is a, a wonderful, wonderful passage of Scripture that the Apostle Paul penned many years ago. And th there have been tributes and there was letters and all sorts of things going through my, on my phone and on my email about, you know, Happy Easter from Europe and everywhere. And, and this day is just an amazing day. Last week we put on a small video clip called What is Good Friday All About? And I, I gotta tell you, I used to struggle with that myself. Because Good Friday, why can it be good when it was such a sad day? And every time I'd have to get up and preach on a Good Friday morning on the Gold Coast, I'd be thinking, my Lord, what do I say? It's sad, it's, it's tragic. And then, then I had a revelation that really, it's on the cross that Christ paid for all our sins. And that's why it was good because the bad that happened to him was the good that happened to me, that my slate has been wiped clean, that I have freedom. I am healed because of him nailing my sicknesses on the cross, because he nailed our curse and our, our infirmity and our disease, our sin on the cross. That's why it's good. But today, of course, being Resurrection Sunday, this is what the Apostle Paul says in chapter 3, verse 10. And it says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. And so I want to know him, number one. And number two, I want to know the power of the resurrection. We often say that, uh, I mean, even in the song we sang earlier, that, Easter, that, that there is freedom in what Christ has done for us. You see, Easter, Easter brings freedom to us. Christmas, we, we celebrate the birth of Christ. Easter, we celebrate that He brought freedom to you and I and that on Resurrection Sunday, that same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us who received Him as Lord and Saviour. And that changes everything. And so when we talk about Easter brings freedom, well, what can Christ set me free from? What can Christ bring me freedom in? Well, number one, I can be free from the guilt of my past. Guilt is the number one destroyer of happiness. It's the number one source of stress. It's the number one source of physical illness. It's the number one cause of depression, guilt. All of us feel guilty at certain times because we've all done things we shouldn't have done. We've all said things we shouldn't have said. And there is an enemy who always reminds us of the fact. I mean, you said this, or you did that. But the good news is this, that God wants your slate and my slate to be wiped clean. And the only way he could do that is by doing what he did on Easter. Laid his life down for us. 
They didn't kill him. He gave his life for you and I. It's a different story altogether. And that we are forgiven. You see, by the death of Christ, we are set free. And that is that our sins are forgiven. The Apostle Paul says it like this in, in uh, Ephesians 1. He says, he says that uh, by the death of Christ, we are set free. Our sins are forgiven. Now, I don't know if I'm supposed to be changing that or you are. But if you can change it, that's fine. Um, I can be free from... Yeah. Is that me doing it or are you doing it? You're doing it. Okay. Okay, I won't touch it. I won't touch it. Okay. You see, God wants to set you free from guilty feelings. Even if there was no such thing as heaven, and there is, that fact alone that he wants to free us from our guilt of the past is worth receiving Christ as your Lord and Saviour. The fact is you can have life victoriously. Jesus said, I come to give life and give it abundantly. And the whole thought of that is that we can have life because of the resurrection power of Christ. You see, he has cancelled, Colossians 2, 14 says, he has cancelled every record of debt that we owed. And you see, I mean, you don't, re you don't remember a cancelled check, do you? Or a debt that's been paid, you don't even think about it, you forget about it. You see, he wants to give you a second chance and it's never too late to start again. The Bible says in Romans 8 verse 1 that therefore now, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That, that's a wonderful, wonderful scripture because that means from this moment on there is now no condemnation. Reminds me of a lady whose husband died and as a widow she put on her tombstone, the light of my life has gone out. Tragic, sad. Two years later, she met another man and she married him and she decided to go back to the tombstone and said, I've struck a new match. <laughs> I mean, God wants to give you and I a second chance. Easter Sunday is a chance for you and I to have another chance, to, to do something fresh. Because I believe this, that when God, God wants you and I to, what, what God has forgiven, I can forget. And I want you to allow this to happen today. Be liberated from the guilt of your past. Second thing God wants us to do is he wants to set us free from the worry about our future. Did you know that Australians are a bunch of warriors? Man, we worry about everything. We worry about our debts. We worry about our, our future. We worry about our, our bills, our problems, our health. We even worry about our worries. And the fact is that, that we, 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 we tend to worry about all sorts of things. And God wants to set you free from worrying totally. You see, I used to think that, uh, I, mean, I mean, it's a problem for me that I had to, I've had a couple of stents put in my arteries and, and of course I've got to watch what I eat. But every time I pick up the newspaper, I read something that, that some food types are no good for me. You know, you read that this is no good for you, that's no good for you. Every time it's like you're reminded of the fact that this is no good for you. The water, the water that you drink is no good for you. The air that you breathe is no good for you. I mean, it's almost like, my well, goodness me, they, me, you can be worried about all sorts of things. But I want to tell you that I put my trust in God and it's very important. But the biggest worry game you and I play is what if? What if I eat this? and something happens? Or what if I do this and something happens? And what if? And who's ever played the what if game? I think many of us have played the what if game. It's a terrible game and there are no, it's a lose-lose game. You, you can't win in this game. And I've got to tell you, sometimes people say, well, what happens about my future? If I worry about my future? And as Judy said, that uh, Saul Worried about his future, so he went to a medium. And sometimes, you know, people in this nation and many other nations, they go to mediums, they go to teacup readers, or they go to palm readers, or they go to some fortune tellers, or some psyches, or, or whatever. And the fact is that people, people are paying good money for that kind of thing. But you can go to God and say, God, I'm going to put my trust in you, because you hold the future. Not about, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. When you can start to know that because God is in you, all of a sudden things change and your worry level decreases. Peter said it like this in 1 Peter chapter 1. God's spirit has been at work in your heart through Jesus Christ. May God grant 
you increasing freedom from all anxiety and fear. The Bible says, don't panic, pray. Jesus said, give your burdens to me, lay them at my feet, and I will make your burdens light. What an amazing thing that is. You see, we, worry has never solved any problems. Worry is useless. Worry cannot change your past. Worry cannot control your future. All it does is mess today up. And I would just say, let's just put our trust in God and let Him do the thing. Philippians 4.13, this is the secret, I believe, of free, worry-free living, is in Philippians 4.13. If you haven't got it, it's up there somewhere, but write it down. It says this, this is what the Apostle Paul says, I am ready for anything through the strength of Christ who lives in me. That's the secret of worry-free living. Trust your future to the one who knows the future. And so when you do that, all of a sudden, you can live today without a worry in the world. Wouldn't that be liberating? Isn't that a free, free uh, it's a real fr uh, a freeing up thing, isn't it? That you can live today, you can leave this building today without a worry in your life. And what I love about the Resurrection Sunday is that through the power of Christ, the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in me, and I can live with that. I can live with the wor without a worry about the future because he who knows the future is living in here. I tell you, that's a real liberating thing. God says, don't worry, just trust me. I'll handle the issues. That's the end of the bottom, that's the bottom line. Number three, Christ can set me free from living without a purpose. I don't know about you, but deep inside every single person, I believe there's a desire to know God. There's a desire to recognize that God has a plan for you and I. And uh, I want to tell you, I, I stand here today knowing that when I had all the different plans, I had planned my life out. I was going to do this and I was going to do that. And I can tell you stories about how I had planned my life out. But the fact is, things came in. And just when I thought, you know, have you ever heard the saying that just when you think you're going to make the ends meet, somebody removes one of the ends? And, 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 and that's, that's a terrible thing. You, you know, you plan your life and you, you say, oh, I'm going to make the ends meet. And then somebody, something happens and the one end is removed. And then you've got to start all that. It's like playing snakes and ladders. You go straight down the bottom and start again. But people try all sorts of things to, to find purpose in life. Some people try pleasure. You know, they fill their life with pleasure. I was in the Air Force and we used to live for the weekends. I was an unsaved guy. I believed in God, but I never had a relationship with him. And so, man, we couldn't wait till Friday afternoon, knock off time. And now we are free to do what we want to do. But boy, was it such a miserable thing Sunday night when you think tomorrow I've got to go to work. And I'm no longer doing the things I want to do. But you see, when you let God plan and purpose your life, the Bible says that He has a purpose for your life. The Bible says there's a purpose for everything. And so when, when you want to live with a purpose, all of a sudden, every day can be a weekend. Every day can be a Saturday or a Sunday. And it's not just Sunday you come to church, but every day God has a plan and a purpose. It's a wonderful, wonderful life, let me tell you. But people try and they go for the thrills and the chills, you know, on the weekend. And, and then they come back on Monday and say, oh no, it's Monday. And it's, it's like... You got five days of sheer misery and then two days of what is thought of happiness, but it's not really even happiness. But I want to tell you that if you, have, if you live with purpose, every day is happy. Some people try prestige and power and popularity that, 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 that will give them meaning for life. They, they get fame or status or, or they, they get achievement because of the kind of car drive they drive or whatever. And I remember, you know, I had a friend of mine, we used to have a, he went, he, he, uh, he joined uh, a, a um, civil airline company the same year as I joined the Royal Australian Air Force. I did 20 years in the Royal Australian Air Force and he did 20 plus years in the civil airlines. And we would be, you know, seeing who can outdo each other in this. 
He'd buy a sound system, I'd buy a bigger one. He'd buy a car, I'd buy a better one. I mean, we try and outdo each other. And in the end, I thought, this is a useless activity. You can't live a life like that. I mean, we're still friends, by the way, after 50 years of, of friends. But the fact is this, that people do what I tried to do back then, to try and get some f- form of, of, uh, of uh, esteem or some form of purpose for my life by putting this sort of stuff in. And some people try f- to find meaning in acquiring position, position, possessions, all different kinds of possessions. You know, they say that the, the guy with the most toys wins. Well, someone, I saw a bumper sticker once that the guy, the one who dies with the most toys, still dies. And I think that that is not, that that doesn't give you a good future. So I want to say to you that the good news is that you are not an accident. The Bible says, I have a plan for you before you were born. There is a plan that I have for you, and it's much bigger than the plan you have been thinking about. My plan for you is amazing. Would you just put your trust in me and let me show you, reveal to you the plan that I have for you. And you will find joy unspeakable and full of glory. You see, that's what this church is here for. We as a church are committed to watching our people succeed in every form of life. their physical, spiritual, emotional, in every form of life. That's what, that's what we're here for. The local church, I believe, is the hope of the world. And I'll tell you that when you come to church, you sit, you, 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 you sit under the presence of God and he'll reveal himself to you so that you can be free from living without a purpose. So you can be free living without worry. So you can be free without living in guilt. The church is the body of Christ, and every member has a part to play in it. Success is being what God has meant for you to be. And that's a wonderful thing. Acts chapter 20, verse 24 says, Life is worth nothing unless I use it for doing the work assigned to me by God. That's a wonderful thing. And fourthly, Christ set me free from having to earn my way to heaven. Colossians 2.20, the Apostle Paul says, Christ has set you free from following the world's idea of how to be saved by doing good and obeying various rules. That's the world's idea of living. That's the world's idea of, well, I'll live a good life. Well, the fact is that, yes, you can live a good life, but doesn't mean that you're going to spend eternity with God. If I was to go down to the corner store uh, in the shopping center and ask a few people about the, this question, so I, I, would, I would ask this question if, if, um, and, the, the, and do a survey of people who are, are you going to heaven? I reckon 99% of people say, I hope so. 99% would say, I hope I do go to heaven. Um, I, I, I try to be good, they would say. I try to be good. I try not, I try not to do anything wrong. The trouble is that's the, that's the wrong answer. You see, that's the world idea of how you get to heaven. Here is what the Bible says about your future. It says this, that God knows more about it. And, and of course, let me tell you, when, when you look at this, God knows more about this sort of thing. And Stu Miller, who's one of the pastors here in this church, he's up in uh, Toowoomba at the moment at the Easter Fest talking about the very same thing I'm talking to you now about. Because, you see, I saw his plan, program on his, uh, on his mission that he does. He's one of our national mi- mi- uh, missionaries that he talks about how do you get to heaven. And first of all, this is what, what, what happens. Heaven is a perfect place. Absolutely perfect. There is no sin in heaven. There is no crime in heaven. There is no bad motives in heaven. There is no disease no sickness, no mistake. Per- heaven is a perfect place. Second thing about heaven is only you have to be perfect to go there because the minute you as an imperfect person goes there, heaven becomes a imperfect place. But heaven has to be perfect. 
And you say, well, that's right. I don't stand a chance. No, you're right. I don't stand a chance either if it had to be like that. That's why God invented plan B. If plan A was that, you know, heaven's a perfect place and only perfect people go there, but he did. God, through Easter, he developed plan B. And that was to send Jesus Christ to, to pay a price for us. Heaven's a perfect place, and if God let you in, that's the end of it. So this is plan B. Plan B says that uh, you don't earn the right to go to heaven. Romans 4.4 4 says this. You don't earn the right to heaven. No, for being saved is a gift. If a person could earn it by doing good, or by being good, then he wouldn't be free. But heaven is a free gift. It's a gift of God. You just have to trust God. You put your trust in Christ. The only way to go to heaven is through Jesus Christ. You don't go to heaven by regulations. You don't go to heaven by rituals. You don't go to heaven by religion. God says it's not rules and all that kind of stuff. It's a relationship with God. It's knowing Christ in a personal way. And my first scripture was, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to know him first. When I know him and I know him, I have a relationship with him. It's a different thing altogether. Romans 6.23 says, the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So how can I be certain what happens to me after I die? Well, you just need to accept the gift. If you accept the gift, it's yours. The obvious question is, have you received the gift? Have you received this free gift? Every one of us came to Easter for some reason. You may have come because, well, this is your church. Or if this is your church and if you're, done, if you're not here, you might get a phone call from me. Maybe that's why you're here. Or maybe you came because you were brought by a friend. Maybe you came because, well, it's the religious thing to do. I, I go to church at Easter. The fact is, I believe that every one of us is not here by accident. You see, God has already planned. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows that you are going to be here on this Sunday, on the 20th of April, 2014, you will be here at the Rock Church. He would have known about that. It's not an accident to him. And, but regardless of what you and I think, that's God's plan. God already has a plan. God wanted you to slow down enough so that you can hear his voice. Slow down enough to say, hey, I can be free from this. I can live a life without worry. I can live a life without guilt. I can live a life without having to earn my way to heaven. Most importantly, you can have a confidence that when somebody asks you, are you going to heaven? You can say, yes, sir, I am. You see, one of the things that an assurance of salvation is a powerful thing. It's not about, well, I don't, know if I, I don't know if I will go to heaven. It's a few weeks ago I talked about, you know, being holy. Being holy is not being in church. Being holy is not even being born again necessarily. Being holy is being so close to God that you sense and feel his presence. That's holy. That's why when we sing the song, Holy is the Lord, because all the elders and angels, they're around the throne and, and they're not holy because of where they are, uh, who they are. They're holy because where they are. You see, we, we, are, we are born again, not because we know about God, but because we have a relationship with Him. And once you have a relationship with Him, you know Him. It's like the Apostle Paul said, I want to know Him and the power of His resurrection. If you would say today, I want to know him, you can do that. You can make a decision, say, well, I want to know him. But the most important thing is you are here because God says to you, I love you. And he wants you to know that you are important to him. You are important to him. What you do is important to God. And if you were to just say, okay, God, I'm going to put my trust in you. I'm going to put my hope in you. What a wonderful thing that could be. These four benefits, I can live guilt-free, I can live worry-free, I can live with a purpose, and I can live not having to earn my way to heaven is a wonderful, wonderful plan 
of God for you this Easter. That's the good news. You can be forgiven. That God will help you in the future if you put your trust in him. It's a question of trust. I wonder if the musicians and singers can come back. And I want to follow, uh, allow them to sing one song and, and then I want to just ask you to um, think about what I've just said. You see, if you, want, if you want to know God, the only way to, if you want to get to know me, the only way you get to know me is by building a relationship with me. You can know about me, but if you, if you, if you want to know me, you want to hang around me. And I think that's the way it is with God. If we want to get to know God, we need to hang around God. We need to, we need to hang around uh, God's people so we can get to know Him. And that's why that verse is so important, what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians, where he says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Him and the power of His resurrection. You see, when you live like that, then there is no problem about the future. There's no problem about, about tomorrow because you can trust God with yourself because he has a plan and that plan is probably much better than what your plan is for you. I wonder if you'd stand with me as we sing this song.